Hello, I'm Monse Alvarado, and this is EWTN News In Depth. Promoting religious freedom for all, from Native Americans trying to protect their sacred land to Catholic medical professionals faced with providing treatment in conflict with their religious beliefs. American bishops tell us how you can help. Where to house immigrant children crossing our southern border? A leading voice from Catholic Charities in Texas weighs in as the numbers surge and faith-based facilities face closure. But it was that it has been 25 years since my last confession part that I was like, my goodness, what is going to happen in here? And how much time does this poor man have? Confession hesitancy. It's more common than you might think. Some insight and advice on how to embrace a sacrament meant to unburden your soul. EWTN News In Depth is next. Welcome to EWTN News In Depth. We begin with a call from American bishops for you to pray, reflect, and act. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has designated eight days, June 22nd through June 29th, as Religious Freedom Week. Your support begins with prayer. Religious freedom, right, is a core value of the founding of our beloved country. Cardinal Timothy Dolan, chairman of the Committee for Religious Liberty at the USCCB, reminds the faithful that our First Amendment right allows Catholics to live out their faith in public and to serve the good of all. And it's not a coincidence that we observe this celebration as we approach Independence Day, the 4th of July. See, we Catholics want to work to protect our charitable institutions, our schools, hospitals, foster care services. The USCCB is calling the faithful to pray for a different topic each day of the week all reflective of trials or conditions that the church and other faiths have recently faced, including adoption and foster care, Catholic social services during the pandemic, the Equality Act, church vandalism, Catholics in Nicaragua, conscience rights for medical professionals, Christians in Iraq, and free speech. The theme this year is solidarity and freedom, to promote freedom for all religions in the U.S. and throughout the world. In Arizona, several Native American tribes and organizations are currently suing the U.S. government to protect an indigenous sacred site called Oak Flat. It is our religious right to be able to practice our ceremonies in our sacred places. The area is used to pray, collect water and medicinal plants, and to perform sacred ceremonies. The U.S. government promised the land to a foreign copper mining company, which would create the largest copper mine in the United States. Meantime, in another federal case, a court in North Dakota sided with religious medical professionals in a lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The court protected Catholic medical professionals in hospitals and organizations, saying they have the right to refuse performing or providing insurance coverage for gender transition procedures if they violate their religious beliefs. Religious Freedom Week aims to draw attention to cases like these and to defend the rights of all Americans to practice their faith. The mandate is pending appeal with the Biden administration defending it in court. The Sisters of Mercy at the University of Mary in North Dakota was one of the religious groups that stood against the mandate. The president of the university, Monsignor James Shea, joins us now from Bismarck, North Dakota. Monsignor Shea, thank you for joining us for this discussion. Monsi, I'm happy to be here with you. So tell us about your case. What was it like being at the forefront of this legal battle? Right, so we had received a, a generous grant from the Department of Health and Human Services in the summer of 2016 for our nursing program. We have a very good nursing program at the university, and, um, and it was for rural health care education. And in terms of sort of the good usage of, of, uh, of government funding, that was a pretty good investment because we know how to do rural health care in North Dakota. But very soon after we received that grant, we also received news uh, that there was a, a new non-discrimination interpretation which was attached uh, to the funding. Uh, and we didn't know that when we had accepted the funds originally. And it had to do with uh, the definition of sex in non-discrimination policy meaning that we needed to prove in order to continue to administer the funds uh, for rural health care education, we needed to prove that we weren't uh, discriminating in terms of new categories of definitions of sex, uh, gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, or a new phrase, termination of pregnancy, 
We needed to prove that we weren't discriminating against those in our own self-funded uh, health insurance program for our employees and that we were referring for such procedures. So we needed to cover off all of those different types of procedures regarding sex transition, uh, regarding sterilization, uh, regarding even abortion, termination of pregnancy. We needed to cover all of these different things in our employee health insurance program and also refer for such procedures out of our student health clinic. And so that was really devastating for us because we knew that in conscience, we weren't able to do that. And so we inquired as to whether there was a religious exemption, because oftentimes in Title IX uh, um, or Title VII, oftentimes uh, there are religious exemptions. And we were told it was really jock shocking and jarring, actually. We were told that, that religious conviction uh, and religious freedom is not a cloak. It's not meant to be a cloak for uh, discrimination. Uh, and of course, we're not discriminating, uh, but we are administering according to our conscience as a Catholic organization and a Catholic university. And so uh, that was really um, a, a sort of crucible moment for us in which we decided, uh, even if we tried to give the money back, it wouldn't have mattered because they had other kind of um, uh, sort of traps set along the way for us. And so we needed to, to make a decision as to what we were going to do. And so the Beckett Fund uh, moved in beside us and assisted us and other plaintiffs as well, the Religious Sisters of Mercy, SMP Health Systems, uh, Catholic Benefit Association, and other plaintiffs joined in this case, and we challenged the rule. We filed the and lawsuit. And you won. We did. So we filed the lawsuit on the eve of the 2016 election, and we received relief from the District of North Dakota in the, um, uh, on the eve of the inauguration this year. There was a period of time in which the Biden administration could appeal the ruling, and they did. And so now we're going to the Eighth Circuit. And so then what comes next for you at the Eighth Circuit? You're going to keep fighting? That's right. So it, we're, we're told that the procedure, our, our lawyer at the Beckett Fund, Luke Goodrich, who's an amazing human being and who's really been terrific in terms of keeping us abreast of things and helping us prudently to chart the course, because we're not we're not looking unnecessarily to make waves or to have a big show, but we want to defend our religious freedom and our ability to be a Catholic university in this country and do good work in, in rural education and nursing health care. Uh, and so uh, that's something that we were good at doing, that we love to do, and that comes out of our mission. And so now we're at the Eighth Circuit. It, I'm told that the procedure uh, there probably will take about a year, and, and we're confident uh, that we should prevail. That's fantastic. Well, Monsignor Shea, let's talk about something that describes why you got into this legal battle, your new book, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission, where you reflect on the beginning of the church. You say there were right. 11 so, bishops and a few hundred Christian believers. How should the state of the church as it is, uh, as it was then, inform how we think about it today? Right. So this small book, it's really an essay which was published last year by the University of Mary, From Christendom to Apostolic Mission. Uh, is built upon the premise that we find ourselves in a new apostolic moment, that the Christendom age, the time in which um, sort of the, the, the cultural mindset of the society was informed by the gospel, that that age has passed and we find ourselves in a new apostolic age. This really is at the basis of the new evangelization that Pope St. John Paul II and Benedict XVI and Pope Francis have talked about. And so we find ourselves in a new apostolic age. In the new apostolic age, the church, and especially the church's institutions, need to be very savvy and move in a different way uh, and allocate resources differently and, um, and, and shape the, the imaginative vision of the institutions uh, that they're entrusted with differently than they would in a Christendom time. And so the book simply spells out some of the strategies for a new apostolic age. And we had much less then than we do now. There's one page in your book where you go through everything that we have now, the institutions, <laughs> the number of individuals who are part of the church, the number of leadership, you know, members of leadership, women, religious, all of these things we have now and what we had then where we were still able to grow the church. Um, what is your advice then for us and for, you, for the viewership of EWTN on how they should embrace this, uh, this apostolic mission? 
Right, so the, the page that you're talking about takes us all the way back to the moment after the Ascension and at the time of the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so we're talking about the Ascension and Pentecost there. And if you had done a SWOT analysis, it would have been a pretty uh, a, a dire and, um, and a heartbreaking thing. The church didn't have a whole lot at the very beginning, but the church had the Holy Spirit, and we still have the Holy Spirit today. That means that we should never be discouraged by social analysis, and we we should never believe those who predict the, de the demise of the church. In other words, no matter what happens, in every single age, we've seen that the Holy Spirit who lives within the church and breathes life into us is everlastingly new. And so it's no surprise that even with all kinds of new ideologies that spring up and then feel old and tired and weary almost immediately, on the, on the stage at all times, the youngest thing going, the freshest thing going, is the Catholic faith. And that's because the Holy Spirit inhabits the church. We should never lose heart or become discouraged. Our belief is ever ancient, ever new. Thank you so much, Monsignor Shea. I really appreciate you being with us today. Oh, God bless you, Monsi. Great to be with you. Up next, we continue our conversation on religious freedom with a focus on Latin America. The religious persecution Catholics are facing in several countries there. When the penitent says his or her sins, the priest is always so happy to be able to help, to be able to console, to be able to advise that penitent moving forward. And demystifying confession. A priest takes us behind the screen and explains a sacrament many of us avoid. EWTN News In Depth will be right back. And we also want to pray for our fellow Christians in places like Nicaragua, Nigeria, and Iraq, who face aggressive persecution. Cardinal Dolan asked Catholics to pray for Nicaraguans suffering from religious persecution during the USCCB's Religious Freedom Week. Welcome back to EWTN News In Depth. Tensions are high in Nicaragua as President Daniel Ortega's authoritarian government continues to crack down on opposition heading into elections. A fifth presidential hopeful was arrested this week. Catholic clergy calling on Nicaraguans to be courageous and work for peace. Catholics make up nearly half the population, and the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom says they have been targeted for giving aid to pro-democracy demonstrators. Their report says security forces have been blamed for surrounding Catholic churches during mass, throwing projectiles at churches, mobs physically assaulting parishioners in church, and clergy receiving death threats. Those threats forced Rome to recall Bishop Silvio José Baez of Managua, who was assaulted with other clergy while trying to shield demonstrators. We turn to Andrea Leal Strench, the executive director of the Inaltum program, an educational institute that works to present the relevance of the teachings of the church to both public and private sectors, and Alejandro Williams Becker, a professor at Universidad Austral and executive director of the Interreligious Dialogue Institute in Argentina. Thank you both for joining us today. Andrea, what can you tell us about the situation in Nicaragua after three years of unrest? Is this a typical role for the Catholic Church in offering protection from the government? for pro-democracy efforts? Thank you, Monson. and thank you for having me on. Yes, of course, the Catholic Church currently is trying to support um, a pro-democracy environment in Nicaragua. Originally, the Catholic Church was called to actually mediate between the government and protesters. Once the government turned violent, the Catholic Church stepped up to protect those who were physically hurt. And this is not all. The Catholic Church is suffering an all-encompassing persecution. This means that administrative measures are being implemented against the Church, uh, of course, keeping the Church from being able to perform its ministry. Um, the, these measures include uh, asking gas and electric companies to, uh, to stop providing services to churches, uh, rejecting leases to priests. Of course, the Church need the support and international support to continue defending democracy in Nicaragua. Alejandro, what about the situation in Nicaragua for you? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you for inviting me. Yes, uh, I think that um, we have to learn from past experiences and we have to learn also from uh, what's going on in Nicaragua for the future prospects of peace in other countries in which democracy is in threat in Latin America. Because the involvement of the church in these uh, peace-building efforts 
uh, puts uh, uh, bishops, uh, priests, and uh, lay people in the risk of uh, getting uh, targeted as uh, enemies of uh, these uh, regimes. So I think that it's a very delicate situation, and uh, the community should be there condemning the attacks and supporting the Catholic Church in Nicaragua. Andrea, what about the situation in Chile? Can you give us an update on COVID and worship restrictions, which are also pro-democracy issues? Of course. What we have to understand is that Nicaragua is not alone in suffering religious persecution. Other countries, like you mentioned, in Chile in the area, face administrative burdens. And in the wake of COVID-19, there have been many unfair restrictions implemented against churches. Um, if, for example, in the city of Los Angeles, many churches were forced to close um, arbitrarily and unjustly. Um, currently, and thankfully, the Supreme Court ruled against, ruled that it was unconstitutional to imprison two pastors who wanted to continue uh, celebrating services. And so the situation in the U.S. compared to the situation in Latin America seems similar with a little bit of progress here at home. Alejandro, you're in Argentina. What is the religious freedom situation there related to COVID? Well, there has been a lot of abuses from the, the government in uh, forbidding masses, in uh, kind of uh, uh, unconstitutional restrictions, even forbidding people to touch the images in the church. So I think that... Um, the, there's a very bad uh, precedent uh, from this uh, quarantine for the future of religious liberty. And of course, we are very aware of the situation of uh, the Paves case from Chile, that it's, it had a negative um, opinion on the uh, Inter-American Human Rights Commission, and it's going to the Human Rights Court. And uh, it would be a very bad precedent for religious freedom and the freedom to teach in religious institutions in our countries, too. So. Right. The Pavis case is one we're going to be watching closely and talking to our audience about, where we're dealing with church autonomy issues, the right of churches to hire and fire their own individuals who are teaching religion um, to the faithful. Um, with the recent legalization of abortion, are you seeing religious freedom conflicts arise from that as well? Yes, of course. There is a, a very big threat uh, uh, towards um, uh, conscientious objection here in Argentina. They are trying to force the the law to to pursue uh, doctors who refuse to perform abortions, and uh, of course they are they are counting with the the ratification of the the covenant of Belén do Pará in order to to have a, a more arguments there. So we are in a kind of a very difficult situation with a lot of persecution to medicals and to uh, also is a Catholic establishment. And so you're not seeing any religious exemptions from those mandates? Uh, apparently they are regarded, of course, they are uh, supported by human rights covenants, by our constitution, uh, but uh, they are trying to work out uh, the situation to force the, the professionals to, to perform abortions, uh, even uh, trespassing conscientious objections uh, clauses, so. So that's problematic. Andrea, what about COVID restrictions in Mexico? Is our neighbor to the south any different from Chile and Argentina? Well, actually, no. Mexico has struggled as well with unfair restri COVID restrictions. For example, in Tijuana, which is a border city uh, with the U.S., um, you know, there was a point where uh, churches were completely closed, but theaters and, and movie uh, cinemas were open, operating at 30 percent capacity. Um, most of these restrictions were fought through the press and public opinion, but not in the courts, as has been the case in the U.S., um, right now, what's important is to build a legal framework that protects religious rights. So these unfair measures in the future can be fought in the courts as well. And what kind of protections exist in Mexico? Are there uh, constitutional protections there, or have there been amendments to the laws recently that protect religious freedom? Of course, the Mexican Constitution protects religious freedom, and it, we must, but we must guarantee that this is in practice actually implemented. Um, of course, at a state level, uh, constitutions as well protect religious freedom, but it is hard uh, when um, the public is not used to having to fight these challenges in courts. 
Andrea and Alejandro, my last question for both of you. Andrea, starting with you, in a recent article, you mentioned that secularization has a role to play in the issues of religious liberty in Latin America. Can you expand on that? Of course. Um, Latin America is usually seen as a region that is predominantly uh, Catholic, uh, predominantly a religious region. Uh, but unfortunately, that is no longer the case. Um, an increasing wave of secularization uh, has changed uh, church affiliation numbers, and more important than that, it has changed uh, the um, number of people who actually consider religion to be an important part of their lives. Um, you know, a re recent numbers show that in Chile, Mexico, and Peru, less than half of the population would say that uh, religion plays an important role. And for example, in Mexico, only about 5% of the population who say they're affiliated with a church uh, actually consider themselves practicing their religion. Alejandro, what are your thoughts on the effects of secularization? Yes, I think that we, we, we were not uh, aware of the importance of religious freedom because we thought that we have kind of the monopoly, you know, in this matter. So I think that that's one of the challenges. We have to uh, enforce our uh, involvement with the, the human rights movement. We have to enforce our presence in human rights forum, in sustainable development forums, uh, uh, preaching and uh, defending religious freedom there in order to, to, to foster this consciousness of the importance of religious freedom in this uh, new context, uh, that we are not even uh, fully aware of how difficult it would be in the next years for us to, to defend it. So we have to build, like, uh, work on our coalition building uh, around these specific issues. Uh, we have to look for broader uh, alliances uh, through interreligious dialogue, through Human Rights Forum, in order to uh, strengthen our position as defenders of uh, um, religious freedom. That's very, very clear to all of us as we pray along with the USCCB and the bishops for religious freedom in Latin America and around the world. Thank you so much for joining us. Join this discussion on our EWTN News In Depth social media channels. You can weigh in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I said, bless me, Father, I've sinned. It has been 25 years since my last confession. But before I could finish the word confession, <laughs> this, this priest goes, Mamma Mia! <laughs> Next, the joy and relief of returning to confession. A look at the grace and renewal it provides to the Christian walk through life. Of the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church, confession is one many find intimidating. Some parishioners avoid going for years. In this Catholic Life Report, Mark Irons spoke with several Catholics about their journey to the confessional and the grace they say they're now receiving. It had been a quarter of a century since Charles Davidson went to confession. What do you say after 25 years? He was baptized in the Catholic Church, but fell away from the faith. Eventually, Davidson returned and marked the occasion by making a confession. During a work trip in Paris, he stopped at the Cathedral of Notre Dame. He felt intimidated, but knew he should go. I felt the love of Jesus pouring out onto me. There was never a moment that that intimidation was founded. Confession isn't just for those who have been away for years. Father Daniel Gee in the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, says everyone is in need of the grace offered through the sacrament. If you want to be perfect as God the Father is perfect, you need your soul to be perfectly cleansed. And in order to keep your soul cleansed, you need the sacramental grace of confession. At St. Rita's Parish, confessions are heard every day. On a very human level, if something is rarely available, I'm going to naturally think it's probably not that important. If something is available all the time and is emphasized in the preaching and in the teaching and in the practice, then I'm going to consider it as something that is important. The Catechism of the Catholic Church states, those who approach the sacrament of penance obtain pardon from God's mercy for the offense committed against him and are at the same time reconciled with the church, which they have wounded by their sins and which by charity, by example, and by prayer labors for their conversion. I think that the sacrament of confession is such a great place of renewal um, where I go to kind of find peace and to begin again every time I fall down. That wasn't always how Krista Kyle felt about and confession. So a graduate student, Kyle says there was a time when she avoided it for over a year. 
During that time, this is how she felt. A lot of just defeat, you know, um, thinking I have fallen so many times. Um, what's the kind of like that voice of what's the point in trying? Like, I'm just going to fall again. Father Gee says having those thoughts or any other reservations shouldn't prevent seeking forgiveness. Uh, even if just walking into the confessional may seem challenging. No reason for fear whatsoever. He's reminding Catholics everything said is confidential. And confessing behind a screen is an option. And we can't see you, and we don't want to see you, and we don't care who you are at all. Uh, we just want to forgive your sins. Teresa Gallagher, a wife and mother of four kids, has made the sacrament of penance a key part of her own spiritual life. She tries to go every couple weeks. I just feel like you're more aware of where you are in your um, Christian walk, you know, your, your failures, your sins. So I say to people, it's been six months, I say, you know what, come back in six weeks, come back in four weeks, and, and work that number back and just watch what happens to your soul. Everyone we spoke with shared how they felt upon leaving the confessional. There's still often times when I go to confessional, I walk out and I just feel the joy of being given that fresh start, that chance to start anew. It will inevitably advance your relationship with Christ. There's no substitute for the actual grace than the sacrament of confession. Mark Irons, EWTN News In Depth. Confession is often misunderstood by Catholics. Some of us have forgotten how and others never learned. But it's an important sacrament in which we turn to God for forgiveness for our sins, which he is eager to give. To help us dispel the misconceptions about confession, we're joined now by Father Charles Truyols, director of the Catholic Information Center here in Washington, D.C. Father Charles, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Let's Wonderful. start at the beginning. Um, why do we have the sacrament of confession? Well, that's a good question. Because for many, many centuries, we didn't have the sacrament of confession before Christ, right? So Jesus came and gave us a path, a way so that we could be sure of our forgiveness from God. Up until Jesus, people didn't have other means than elevating their souls to God. And also through the people of Israel, right, we have so many ways of offering sacrifices. And uh, But with Jesus, he gives us a secure and clear way of for us to ask for forgiveness for all our sins, because we are all sinners every day. So then why the sacrament? Why don't we just ask for forgiveness right now? We should. We should always be asking for forgiveness through our contrition, through our um, um, asking God to forgive us, and uh, through our detestation of sin, an aversion of sin, that is what contrition is. We should always be asking God to forgive us for what we do uh, always. But at the same time, Jesus, for us to have a again, a very uh, tangible way of asking him for forgiveness and knowing and recognizing that we have been forgiven, he established this sacrament in which the priest absolves the penitent. And don't forget that the priest at that moment is Christ himself, right? Is Christ through the priest. He acts in the, pers in the person of Christ. So the sacrament is a great way for us to unburden ourselves and be sure that we have been forgiven. So you use the word contrite, contrition, being really, really sorry, right? Absolutely. So then how do we prepare for confession? How should we prepare for confession? Well, first of all, it's important that we make an examination of conscience, that we think of the sins that we have committed since our last confession or since baptism. This is if this is our first confession. Sometimes people have... Um, fallen away from going to confession, or it's been a long time, maybe many years. So a thorough examination of conscience is a very important element. Now you have many lists, many ways of doing that, and the priest can help you when you go to confession. It's very simple. Afterwards, we, you have to, of course, to express your sorrow. And by going to confession, you are expressing your contrition, your sorrow for what you have done. But it's important to express that in front of the priest. And then once you are in the confessional, which is a very um, beautiful place, because it's where the grace of Christ is going to come into our souls to cleanse our sins, our, our soul, right? There, um, after, um, there is where you confess, where you declare 
you name your sins. Right. So we do our examination of conscience and we walk into the confessional, but before that, how do you prepare? Are there things you wear as a priest? How do you prepare for confession? Absolutely. So I always, I try to be in, in, um, in a prayerful mode, right, and prayer. And, abso and also I wear also always a stole, a purple stole, to signify the contrition and the sorrow and the, and the greatness of the sacrament is going to happen at that moment. Sometimes I also wear an alp. And so that's kind of the, the way of the priest in preparing himself for the sacrament. So then what does confession actually consist of? We're all ready to go. I come in. I've done my examination of conscience. I'm in the confessional. And I say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And my last confession was, you know, three weeks, three ago. weeks ago, God last willing. month. <laughs> <laughs> many, many years ago, these things happened. Right? right, right. So have no fear because Nothing. many years ago, there's no judgment there. You're just going to say whatever it is. Absolutely. And God always forgives and embraces. As the, as the parable of the prodigal son, it's a beautiful story of forgiveness and repentance. Now, the priest, when the penitent says his or her sins, the priest is always so happy to be able to help, to be able to console, to be able to advise that penitent moving forward. So it's a great um, opportunity for us to unburden ourselves and also for the priest to help our brothers and sisters. And then we receive some sort of... Absolution. Yes. Right? After the penitent has expressed his or her contrition, the priest gives absolution, which are beautiful words in which the penitent understands that those sins have been forgiven. But before that, he has accepted the penance that the priest gives to the penitent. It can be a prayer, it can be an act of charity, it can be, a, it can be several things. But once the, priest, the penitent has accepted the penance and the priest gives absolution, that person is completely free. And then he will or she will be able to accomplish that penance, that prayer or work of charity or whatever it is, or uh, to be able to reestablish what has been hurt by right. his or her sins. For that grace. Yeah. Um, and so this sacrament is so beautiful and so wonderful. Why, why isn't it more available at churches? That's a good question. So I remember um, be becoming a priest, how um, the founder of Opus Dei, I am an Opus Dei priest, always told us as the new priests, you know, to spend many time, many, a lot of hours in the confessional. And sometimes you can be in the confessional and nobody comes. But he said to us, listen, wait, be patient. You can pray in the meanwhile, and people will start coming. So just being there av available in the confessional is a great sign of fatherhood and of availability for others. So yes, we should be all priests spend time every week, every day, you know, to hear confessions. That's part of our what we are. Well, that's a wonderful call to priests and a little bit of a challenge <laughs> for the churches that don't offer confession and really should. Thank you so much for being Absolutely. with us today. Thank you very much. For more resources on the act of penance and how to properly prepare before walking into the confession booth, head over to EWTN.com. Type the word confession in the search bar for a library full of articles. For the reasons that I have discussed, I shall cast my vote against this flawed bill. From voting rights to infrastructure to a vice presidential trip to the southern border, top news from this week in review. Plus, a symbol of renewal of Jewish life. Decades after the Holocaust, the new post for a German rabbi, when we come back. News from that tragic building collapse in Florida tops the week in review. It's a race against time as rescuers work through the weekend to find potential survivors in the rubble. A large section of the 12-story condo building in Surfside, Florida, collapsed suddenly early Thursday morning as occupants slept. At least four people are confirmed dead and more than 150 people are unaccounted for. A massive search and rescue effort is underway. Despite the so-called pancake collapse, first responders say it's possible there are void spaces within the rubble where survivors could be clinging to life. It's unclear what caused the 40-year-old building to fall. Engineers will conduct a full-scale investigation after the search and rescue mission is over. 
Florida requires all buildings be recertified every 40 years, and the condo, which was erected on reclaimed wetlands, was about to undergo that required inspection. Vice President Kamala Harris visited the U.S.-Mexico border Friday after criticism from both sides of the aisle for not yet going there in person. The vice president is tasked with identifying the root causes of immigration. You've heard me say many times, most people don't want to leave home. And when they do, it is usually because either they are fleeing some type of harm or they cannot take care of the simple and basic needs of their family by staying where they are. The vice president toured a migrant processing center in El Paso, Texas, and spoke with U.S. Customs and Border Patrol. Harris says her recent trips to Guatemala and Mexico laid the foundation of her visit to the U.S. border, noting that the United States is partnering with these countries to address the causes of mass migration and discourage migration to the U.S. Thousands of children and families crossing our southern border are given aid from Catholic Charities. But a move by Texas Governor Greg Abbott threatens that aid. Abbott ordered state regulators to revoke licenses from facilities that housed unaccompanied minors who were apprehended at the border. He issued a disaster declaration that directs the State Health and Human Services Commission to deny pending license applications for facilities sheltering undocumented immigrants. It also gives notice to more than 50 existing facilities that they have 90 days to wind down operations by the end of August. The governor says the influx of people at the border is negatively impacting American children in foster care and the facilities that help them. Catholic Charities offers food, housing, financial assistance, and more to these families. Without housing, these children could be shipped to detention facilities or prison facilities that aren't fit for children. Antonio Fernandez, the CEO of Catholic Charities in San Antonio, Texas, joins us now to tell us how this is impacting his facility and efforts there to help migrant children. Antonio, thank you for being with us today. Uh, thank you for having me. Why is your migrant work, your work with migrant children, so critical? Well, it is critical for us because we see all these children coming to Texas and to the rest of the United States, and they have nothing. I mean, it's just amazing the, the strength they have uh, in their spirit because physically they are just like broken down. I mean, they've been traveling for weeks, most of them, and they get to the U.S., they're afraid, they have anxiety. So when we house in our homes, it's a huge blessing for us and actually it's, it's, it's what we need to do as Christian, as Catholics. And how long are these children typically in your care? In our homes uh, that we have that accompany minors, they're around 45 days to 90 days. Uh, so it's just uh, enough time for us to teach them a little bit of English, try to become self-sufficient, contact them with their family members in the other uh, areas where they're going to go in the United States. So, so we'll try to do as much as we can in that short amount of time. And so then what's the goal of your efforts? Is it reunification? What does that look like? A hundred percent. So a hundred percent for us is reunification of these children with their parents, uh, uncles, grandparents, godfathers, godmothers, anyone who they say already in the United States legally. So these actually kids have a better life. And Antonio, you've been at Catholic Charities for a long time. Why does Catholic Charities get involved in this? Why is this part of your mission? You know, so the reality is that for us, uh, we, in the Archdiocese of San Antonio, um, I'm, I'm sure all the other Archdiocese, we actually believe in saving everybody. Uh, if a child is here in this place, I'm not going to ask, is the child hungry? I mean, is the child, sorry, documented or undocumented? I'm going to be asking, is the child uh, uh, hungry? Does he have a place to sleep? Does he have a shelter? So for us, it's truly like Matthew 25, 35. We work on the stranger. We feed the hungry. We clothe the naked. And I think that means so much to all of us at Catholic Church because we do this with respect and dignity and love for all these children. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, we never have a problem with this case. So it's been a blessing for many, many years to provide for these kids. And when you say many, many years, how many years has Catholic Charities been involved in this work? Uh, Catholic Church San Antonio has been doing this since 2013. Uh, and I know that all their entities through the U.S., other faith-based companies, they may be doing that before. And with all of this time, what kind of uh, representation does Catholic Charities have in terms of serving migrant children? Are they the only game in town? Are there other people who do this work? There are other companies who do it. Uh, but I think what makes us unique is the love that we have. I mean, we don't have a shelter. Our homes are called, one is Elizabeth Ann Sidon, 
uh, as the you know the first female in here, and it's a home for moms who are pregnant, who have babies or toddlers, and the other one is St. Peter's and Joseph. So for us, this is not a shelter. This is a way of living. This is a way of people or treating kids with respect, with love, with dignity, and that makes us so unique. And even you know the facilities that we have are amazing. You know the kids have basketball courts to play if they want to, and at every single home we have a chapel so they can pray if they want to. And what does the government usually say about your services? Are you the gold standard? Well, uh, they have defined our places as like really high standard, like like a hotel for kids, which is not a hotel. But but yes, no, we we really take pride in in the quality of services that we provide, in in the organization that we have, that we provide them with a place to to sleep. But we also have teachers, and we have therapies, and we have you know the, through all the Catholic Church programs, we can provide them with so many more services, so it's wraparound services to ensure that these kids who come with so much anxiety and depression and and they're afraid that they, at least they don't have that because they know they are well taken care, of, like they say, by the church. So then what are the consequences of this of this action by the Texas government? Well, I think for us it's going to be a, a, a huge one. I mean, Catholic Church San Antonio, we have these two uh, our homes. We have around 183 employees who actually lose their jobs. And for the children, you know, we have hundreds of kids every day. So there's going to be a, a huge amount of kids who not have a place uh, that is respectful of them to be here when they are coming in transition from one place to another in their lives. Well, we hope that you'll be able to continue to do that work and bring them together with their families. Thank you so much, Antonio, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Some of the legislative logjam in Washington might be loosening. The White House and a bipartisan group of senators have reached an infrastructure deal. The announcement came on Thursday after a meeting between President Biden and a group of bipartisan senators, five Republicans and five Democrats. The $953 billion infrastructure plan would focus on fixing roads and bridges, airports and ports, water and power systems, as well as broadband improvements. The plan would also create millions of jobs. We're in a race with China and the rest of the world for the 21st century. They're not waiting. They're investing tens of billions of dollars across the board. These investments represent the kind of national effort that throughout our history has literally, not figuratively, literally transformed America and propelled us into the future. The plan falls far short of the $2 trillion plan the president unveiled this spring, and how it will be paid for must still be negotiated through Congress. Democrats say they're still planning to push what they call human infrastructure, including elder and child care, clean energy, and education programs in separate reconciliation legislation. Movement on voting rights remains stalled. On Tuesday, Republican senators blocked debate on a sweeping overhaul of voting rights legislation proposed by Democrats. The Democrats' last hope to enact the law, which they say counters voter suppression, rests on a long-shot bid to eliminate the filibuster. Republicans argue the legislation is nothing more than an unnecessary federalization of elections to benefit the Democrats. They say claims that democracy is at stake are over-exaggerated. However, the Justice Department is getting involved. On Friday, the attorney general announced the government is suing the state of Georgia over new state voting restrictions. Hong Kong's biggest pro-democracy newspaper published its final copy this week as the Chinese Communist Party tightens its grip on a free press. The regime arrested five editors and executives of the Apple Daily newspaper and froze more than two million in assets under a new national security law. The law, imposed last year, sparked massive pro-democracy protests. Activists accused China of walking back promises to retain freedoms of the former British colony. More than 100 people have been arrested under the new law. In a historic first, the Vatican is invoking its sovereign status under a century-old treaty to protest a drafted Italian law. The Vatican is formally opposing a purported anti-homophobia bill, saying that in its present form, it could restrict religious freedom of the Catholic Church in Italy. The measure could require private Catholic schools to adopt curriculum on gender theory or even criminalize the church in Italy for refusing to conduct same-sex unions. The legislation is under consideration in the Italian Senate. 
The new Archpriest of St. Peter's Basilica is clarifying the recent ban on celebrating individual masses there. Cardinal Mauro Gambetti this week said exceptions for individual masses may be allowed for some particular and legitimate needs, which could include masses said in the native tongue of pilgrim groups traveling to the basilica. Ultimately, though, the Cardinal reminded Catholics the nature of Mass is to be communal and that concelebrated Masses remain the norm in St. Peter's. In March, the Secretariat of State posted a communication restricting the celebration of individual Masses at the Basilica's many side altars, which had sparked controversy as there was a long-standing tradition of Vatican priests celebrating their daily Masses in the morning. For the first time in more than a century, the German military inaugurated a rabbi as chaplain. During World War I, many Jews fought for Germany and dozens of rabbis are known to have performed pastoral work in the military. But when the Nazis came to power in 1933, they excluded Jews from all public life, later murdering millions of Jews in the Holocaust. The German army already has Catholic and Lutheran chaplains, and there are plans to introduce Muslim religious counseling in the future as well. When we come back, we'll tell you about a scholarship program focused on persecuted Christians. I got a message that I should wear hijab or act in a particular way or else I should leave the university. Persecuted Christians from crisis countries find support in a program designed to help strengthen their homelands. Hungary steps up after criticism about its tough immigration policies. In 2015, civil war and unrest sparked an unprecedented immigration crisis as refugees from countries like Syria and Afghanistan flooded into Europe. One of the countries that saw the largest influx was Hungary. As hundreds of thousands made their, made their way there, the Hungarian government made the controversial decision to abruptly close its borders, a move sharply criticized by most of the European Union countries. Hungary is largely a Christian country with historically Catholic traditions. Now, years later, a government program is in place focusing on helping persecuted Christians from countries in crisis. Domankas Poulet of EWTN Hungary reports. In 2017, the Hungarian government launched a scholarship program for Christian young people living in crisis regions of the world. The aim of the program is to enable young people to use the knowledge they gain here in Hungary and to bring it back to their own countries. Currently, 166 Christian students from crisis regions study at 14 Hungarian universities. These students come from the Middle East, Africa and Asia. It's a life changing for me. Yeah. Iraqi Catholic student Rita Yova now is pursuing a master's degree in mechanical engineering in Budapest. <laughs> she says that it was hard for her to be a Christian student in Iraq. I got a message that I should wear hijab or act in a particular way or else I should leave the university. Rita says that her experience of studying in a Christian country has made her feel part of a strong global Catholic community. For a minority, it's hard to get your simple rights the rights that every human should have. In Europe, the program hasn't been without criticism, which has prompted the Hungarian state to clarify the purpose of the program and to make sure that it heads in a positive direction. How much time do you have? Tristan Asbay is the state secretary for the Aid of Persecuted Christians and the Hungary Helps program. Today, uh, we live in a time when in the world there are 340 million people who are discriminated or threatened by genocidal attacks uh, for their faith in Jesus Christ. Tristan Asbay says that the program is aimed to stop migration to Europe in the future by directly helping countries where the trouble is, regardless of ethnicity or religion, but prioritizing Christian population. The reconstruction of the, in the physical sense, but also uh, the, the reconstruction of the fabric of the society. All the best. All the best. One postgraduate Catholic student doing just that is Kennedy Mutua from Kenya. He's finishing up a climate change degree in Hungary and says he's looking forward to implementing his new expertise at home. Actually, the reason as to why I'm so enthusiastic is because Europe is being viewed as 
their alma mater in terms of tackling with climate change. Kennedy says that he's thinking of Kenya 10 years from now and wants to help prevent his country from suffering because of climate change. Just like Kennedy, Edwin Waga is also a Kenyan postgraduate student in environmental science. He's a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and when he returns home, he hopes to start an initiative for children living with disabilities in Kenya. This is something close to his heart, as he has a cousin who is deaf and blind. I feel I need to extend the hand of God into helping the less fortunate kids in my community. The witness of these students serve as an example to the Hungarian state while critics blame Hungary for keeping their national borders closed from migrants and refugees. Our support for the Christians is uh, explicit because we are a Christian country, we have this cultural uh, connection. It's not only ideological, it's also humanitarian need. But we extend the solidarity of the Hungarian people to other groups as well. Tristan Asbay says that there's also a sister program in Hungary which is dedicated to all students from developing countries regardless of their background and religion. This year, the neighboring Croatia followed the example of Hungary and established a twin scholarship program for Christian students from crisis countries as well. They agree with the Hungarians that Christians are the most persecuted group in the world, therefore they need extra support. From Budapest, Hungary, Domonkos Pulai, EWTN News, in depth. An exciting first-time report as EWTN just expanded and added an office in Hungary. Our thanks to the team for this very first EWTN Hungary television report. There will be much more coverage from Hungary in the months ahead. The International Eucharistic Congress will be held in Budapest this September. We'd love to share how you're experiencing Catholic life in your home or parish. Email us your video or photos to in-depth at EWTN.com so we can feature them in our images of the week. Thanks to viewer Julie Zepfel for these beautiful images from her garden in Spotsylvania, Virginia, Our Lady framed by clematis vines. We look forward to seeing more viewer pictures in the weeks ahead. And that's a wrap on this edition of EWTN News In Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. We'll continue the conversation same time next week. See you then.